Very hard. I was counting your T's again. <laughs> there was one. I teach in large lecture halls, but for the students who can't attend in person, I also teach those lectures online. But the online experience never feels as good for the students or for myself as actually being in the lecture. Professor Pat Healy at Queen Mary University London studies the subtleties of human interaction. So if anyone can tell me why my online lectures don't work as well as my in-person ones, he can. So I'm going to visit him now. And there he is. Dr. Healy, Pat, hey, nice Hi. to see you. Oh, yeah, elbow. <laughs> like the old, the old COVID elbow. Okay, so I'm coming and designing my lectures right now, and much of this is going to be online. The students have the option of not actually coming to sit in the lecture halls, uh, and I wonder how much that's going to affect their learning. I always have the feeling that that the interaction with the people virtually is not as good somehow, but I can't exactly say why, and I'm hoping that you can help me with some of those details. Well, I can tell you. Uh... Maybe a little. So the, the the thing about live interaction is that it's not you're not just talking, right? Somebody's listening, and so as you're doing right now, as I speak, you give me a little bit of feedback. You okay. nod. So it's, so I'm active in a sense, even though I'm, because I'm actively listening. Exactly, and all of that helps you to uh, monitor how well people are understanding what you're saying, mm -hmm. and also to adapt it. So, you know, you can adjust your message to the people in the room. If you're on, on video, if you're online, you don't get that stuff, right? If it's, if it's purely playback video, you're not getting that live interaction, and it does make a huge difference. A very common story people tell about human interaction is that we mirror each other. A quick definition here. Mirroring, or the chameleon effect, is when someone subconsciously mimics the behavior of other people during social interaction. It's thought to be an innate trait among primates and helps build rapport between people. But, as I'm about to find out, it's not as straightforward as all that. Well, clearly we're not doing that. I, I'm speaking, I'm right, gesturing, and I'm, and I'm sitting with my you've arms got your folded. arms folded, you're nodding. And that's because we're doing systematically different things. Uh, I, you know, I'm talking and I'm listening. you're trying to show me your level of comprehension. I mean, there's experimental evidence that um, a speaker's performance is directly affected by their listeners. So uh, Janet Bavalos did this very interesting study where she gave instructions. Could, could you give the instructions to me? Can I be yeah, the audience? Yeah, sure. Oh, so cool. I, okay. I, I'm the speaker. I've got right. to tell you a story about something that happened to me, like I nearly got run over, tree nearly fell on me okay. or something. So a close call story. And then you either have to listen to the story okay. and just react as you normally would, or you have to count all of the words I use beginning with the letter T. Okay. okay. Now, what's interesting about that is in both cases, you're definitely focused on me, you're definitely paying attention, but when you're counting the words beginning with T, your feedback becomes all wrong. What Janet Bevelis's study discovered is that when the speaker doesn't get affirmative feedback from the addressee, they end up telling a much worse story. Now, I'm starting to see how a lack of good audience feedback can affect me during my lectures. And you can see this in other places. It's just like any other public speaker. During lockdown, you know, I still watched the, the people who do the late night shows and they would give their monologues and, and you could see them struggle. You know, they were, they were trying so hard to make the jokes land and they, they just had to hope. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of really interesting stuff about live comedy where, you know, comedians, you get the same joke from a series of different shows and you'll notice they time it differently. So they wait for a kind of ripple of, of laughter before they'll deliver the punchline. And if they don't get that, they may even insert their own laugh. They'll go, blah, 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 huh? Right. To let them know, get the tension building. Yeah, this is right, you should laugh now. One of the interesting things about live radio audiences is that they were first introduced uh, partly because of the requests of uh, live comedy performers who, who needed an audience. They couldn't deliver it. They couldn't deliver the material because they needed that feedback to, you know, know how to time things, to, to, to feed off yeah. 
yeah. that you know and to make it funny life. for the audience at home i guess that you don't get from canned laughter there's a naturality to knowing the people around them are actually laughing at it it makes you yeah. feel like you want to be part and of it. it somehow enables the performance you know a, a silent stony-faced audience they, they they're very difficult to talk to yeah. very hard <laughs> i was counting your t's again <laughs> busted i had counted four t's in his previous sentence but what was amazing to me was how quickly he picked up on the fact that I was not paying attention to the meaning of his words. To what level have people done other experiments that sort of can break down the granular detail of, of some of those responses? You know, is it, is it literally the, the head nodding? Is it the, the laughing, the looking out the window? What, how much does all that matter? Yeah, it's difficult. So a live conversation obviously is a very messy thing. Right? You know, it's, it's open-ended, open-textured. There's all sorts of stuff going on. It's very difficult to do controlled experiments because it means instead of relying on actors... Yeah, once they know they're supposed to act a different way, it's hard to separate their influence on the experiment versus you yeah, know, their, you, their knowledge of it. So it's you, never a double-blind control with these. Exactly. They, they, they always know what's going on. They have to. And the idea that they can control just one behavior and leave everything else constant, well, you know, it's, it's just impossible. not possible. What's interesting um, lately is the, uh, the fact that we have, you know, have virtual reality in which you, uh, you can you know, be an immersed in a virtual environment, interacting uh, live, full body interaction okay. with another person. That creates really interesting experimental possibilities. So if I do a live motion capture of my hand movements while I'm talking, my head nods, yeah. all of that can be projected onto my avatar in virtual reality. And then we can change just one thing, right? You know, we can subtract yeah. the nods or add nods yeah. or, you know, add a smile or add a blink. Uh, all, so that gives you such fine grained control where you know everything else is constant. You know you've just altered that thing and then you can see what effects that has on the conversation. So it's a really, you know, it's a kind of major leap forward in, yeah. in what's possible experimentally in interaction. I didn't expect to be talking about virtual reality, but it's changing how we interact and how we study interactions. For instance, research at the Max Planck Institute in the Netherlands has used VR to show that listeners who blink slowly cause speakers to use shorter sentences. And there's more. The really interesting experimental possibility and actually sort of future technological possibility is that we can have augmented human interactions. I'm talking to you, but my gestures have changed or my facial expressions have changed or I'm, you know, I'm giving more empathic feedback. Okay. I'm nodding instead of counting the number of T's. Yeah. And, and that, that sort of stuff, it, it creates a really interesting possibility for you know, richer, more expressive, more engaging kinds of communication. There's an interesting uh, experiment that was done on classroom interaction using this kind of virtual environments where imagine you're the lecturer, you've got okay. your, your HMD on, I'm the student, I have okay. my HMD on, I'm sitting in a row of other virtual students, we're all there. The thing that you can create in that environment, which is impossible in real life, is it can appear as though you, the lecturer, are looking at every single student at the same time. Cool. So your eye gaze can go to everybody they would never. <laughs> they um, know enough not to look back. They, they all freeze. When I ask a question. But they would feel that I'm actually talking directly yeah, to them. Yeah, yeah. A lot of this research was carried out by Jeremy Balenson and his team at Stanford University. They also demonstrated that pupils placed closer to the teacher responded more positively to the lesson. With this technology, you should be able to create the optimum learning environment for the student, so long as the class behaves. And what about the students interacting with each other? So that's also interesting. So the, um, what you can do in that virtual environment, virtual classroom situation is then you can play around with the behavior of the people in the room. So regardless of what they're actually doing, you can make it appear as though they're doing other things. So looking at their watches, looking out the window. So the student who's sitting looking at you learns less if the student next to them appears to be paying no attention. And that's, that's an, this has been experimentally shown. That has been, yeah. And so VR has allowed us, or in, and will much more so in the future, allow us to break this down into the little, little bits. We can see how much the blinking affects things. We can see how much the looking out the window, the, the whatever nodding. Uh, so then how do we take all that information? There's lots of bits. Synthesizing it back together and, and, and looking at that emergent complexity that's going to come from that, even into whole new things, that's your job.
<laughs> that's, that's, yeah. That sounds really complicated. Yeah, I think we're only we're only at the uh, you know at the start of a very interesting uh, research program you know across the world actually. The tools are now there to enable you to do these kinds of studies. I think what we need now is to is to build more complex theories of what is happening in interaction. So I think that you know the, the stories we have about the theory you know the theories of what makes an interaction work. We need, you know, we need to build up those up in richer, and more interesting ways to, in order to accommodate those kinds of differences between the way people do things. All right, well, thank you very much, Pat. For now, I'll just know that I'll try to get as many students as possible to keep coming to lecture. Um, it's been a pleasure. Take care. I wanted to know why my online lectures were never as good as my in-person experiences. Professor Pat Healy has told me that it's all down to the subtleties of human interaction. Researchers are using virtual reality to explore the nuances of human interaction. And the virtual marketplace will be taking advantage of this to deliver better customer experience. But also, as educators, perhaps we can take advantage of that to deliver better teaching. Maybe in the future, my virtual lectures will be better if they're not delivered by me, but by my avatar. Until next time, remember that between the question and the answer are all of the really tasty bits. The, I totally forgotten. <laughs> the other thing I was gonna say. I'm lecturing through a mirror dimly of mango chutney and I'm delicious. I'm totally happy with what I've learned here. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, it was great. It's awful. <laughs>